Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to class. Today, we will start our exploration of chapter three on biological psychology. Now, I'd like to take a look at the, um, the syllabus. Sorry, there we go. Uh, this is what you have in your syllabus for the, the course timetable. And I inherited this from the previous instructor, Danielle. And I thought, hmm, how are we doing? I know that um, I canceled a class last week because we finished chapter two ahead of schedule. Um, and I didn't mind doing that. But then I thought, well, what if I end up running out of time later on? And and so then I felt a little bit uncomfortable. I thought, I'm going to count how many classes we have. And so I sat down with the syllabus and I counted that we have 24 lectures left and we have six chapters. And then I looked at the distribution of um, like chapters per lecture. And so there's seven lectures allocated for chapter three, but there's only two lectures allocated for chapter 11. And they're all, you know, about, you know, 45 pages long. So why would I be allocating seven lectures to chapter three and only two lectures to a chapter that's even longer? So I thought, hmm, I don't I don't know if if sticking to this is really the best idea. And, you know, if I were to give them all an equal number of, of lectures and they're all about the same number of pages, well, then it would be four lectures per chapter. And I block that off and I use these, these colored blocks here. And that seems to work, I mean, really well with when the midterms are scheduled for. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. So instead of spending the next seven lectures on chapter three, I'm gonna spend the next four lectures. I have, there's about 80 slides in this deck, four lectures. I'm gonna try to get to slide 20 today. All right. Um, I also know from the having checked the Moodle for the previous course that they didn't cover chapter 11. They didn't get there and then they skipped it and I am um, I'm responsible for covering it. So I hope that this um, this new schedule works a little better. So biological psychology is a subdiscipline of psychology that studies the relationship between the nervous system and behavior. But I'll say they also have um, the endocrine system in there as well, okay? And it was something I noticed um, and it caught my eye and I thought, mm, I'm gonna look into this. So they say that the researchers in this area are called biological psychologists or neuroscientists. Someone has their microphone on, so I just, excuse me while I meet that. You. There we go. All right. So they say that researchers in this area are biological psychologists or neuroscientists, and they're using those terms synonymously. And I thought, hmm, I don't know about that because, you know, not all biological psychologists are neuroscientists, and I've never met a neuroscientist that identified as a biological psychologist. Um, now, there is a, uh, a professor at St. Mary's University uh, was watching these lectures and he came by while I was sitting in the cafeteria at St. Mary's and he took issue with the definition of psychology that that I had presented. And um, he said that he so we learned that, you know, in this course using this textbook, that it is the scientific study of the mind brain and behavior and he said hey you know i i don't think so um it's i don't think it's psychology is a study of the brain that's it's a study of of behavior of the mind and he's right yeah your your textbook uses a non-standard definition of psychology if if you go and, and look up what the you know american psychological association or canadian psychological association definition of psychology is it's um the scientific study of the mind and behavior the other textbook that, that I teach from at, at St. Mary's defines it as, you know, the, the study of how people, you know, think, feel, and behave. But, um, you know, we, we do really well to know about the brain because uh, we know that, you know, our mind 
emanates from our brain and all our behavior is fundamentally controlled um, by our brain. But I thought it was it was interesting to see the textbook authors do this, to claim neuroscience as a dis as a discipline of psychology. They don't do this with sociology, right? They don't say that I've never seen anyone try to claim that social psychologists are sociologists. Right? We don't try to claim sociology, but why are we claiming neuroscience? So what is neuroscience? Um, it's it's the scientific study of of the nervous systems uh, of the nervous system and and how it works. And it's it's a multidisciplinary science that may or may not include psychology. So a neuroscientist could spend their entire career studying you know action potentials or studying the structure of a neuron without ever you know thinking uh, without ever studying thought or or emotion or human behavior. Uh, they also the, these fields also have different um, professional organizations. So um, there's the Canadian Psychological Association is probably the main professional organization for psychology. And then the neuroscientists have a different one. Okay, there's an association for neuroscience. And then um, another thing they do in, in your biological psychology textbook is they have, I think very appropriately, a section on, on hormones and behavior. And hormones are about endocrinology but endocrinology isn't neuroscience. Uh, when, when I was an undergraduate, the, the textbooks were, were talking about the next big thing was psychoneuroendocrinology. And so I thought, oh, I wonder, I wonder what happened to that. And it looks like it didn't really take off. I, there's a journal called psychoneuroendocrinology um, and there's a, a really sketchy Wikipedia article, but all the, the citations are from you know, about 15 to 20 years ago. So to my view, psychology, neuroscience, and endocrinology are, are different disciplines, but they overlap and we do really well to be aware of each other. And, you know, if, if psychology is the study of the human mind, then you know, we should know a thing or two about the brain. You know, it, it's good that we know that that our thoughts and that our consciousness doesn't come from our heart because that's what the ancient Egyptians thought. Uh, but, you know, we don't claim sociology the way we want to claim neuroscience. And sometimes I wonder if psychologists are a little embarrassed to be a social science. And I really feel that our discipline is the most useful and the most powerful when we appreciate that we are, in fact, a social science. And when we think about the social and the cultural lens. So uh, neuroscientists have mapped out the brain of, you think that's human brain? Have we mapped out the human brain? No, that is the brain, the marvelous brain of a fruit fly. Neuroscientists and psychologists do a lot of research on fruit flies. They're, they're quite easy to work with. And they mature quickly. That is unbelievably complicated. There are 25,000 neurons in there. Now you have a lot more neurons than that. And those 25,000 neurons connect into 20 million synapses. And understanding this, Maybe we could better understand and predict fruit fly behavior. So fruit fly behavior isn't too complex. They're very into bananas. But they don't have the, the greatest cognitive ability, right? They, they fall into those, uh, those vinegar traps. So you're able to, um, to outwit them. When I was preparing this, I found myself wondering, well, you know, what do fl fruit flies do? You know, what is, what is their behavioral repertoire? The more complex an organism's behavior, the, the more complex their brains are. Like humans have very complex behavior, very complex brains. Fruit flies have... Sorry, what did you say? I'm not sure if someone has a question or the microphone on.
Okay, I'll just mute that mic. All right, so so I, I was interested, you know, what, what is the behavioral repertoire of, of a fruit fly? And apparently they spend most of their time in, in courtship displays. And uh, the male fruit flies will actually fight other males. So in the picture there, you see them boxing. And then their, their courtship display involves um, the males displaying their legs. So the first picture there, here it is. And let me turn on my light, light laser pointer, is... Uh, is the leg display. So the male says, ha, look at, look at my legs. And he has six of them. And then the next one is elbow rubbing. So, you know, he shows her his nice fly elbows. And then, um, I forget what the third one is, but but if this all works out, then it's sort of get, get on with it. And um, apparently the females reject most of the male's adva uh, advances. So um, other things they do are, you know, finding food, eating. So, so that's pretty, these are pretty basic behaviors. Fighting, feeding, romance, egg laying. That's pretty much about it. They don't write poems. Now think of, of the human brain and how complex that is and how complex our behavior is and how complex the environments that we live in are. Fruit flies don't live in every kind of environment. It's pretty much your, your garbage bin, right? And your kitchen. But humans, wow, we've colonized the earth. Here's a, a metaphor that I've heard. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm having some issue with folks leaving their microphones on, and I don't know if there's a, a setting where I can kind of mute everyone's microphone, but I, I do pick up background noise. So um, you're very welcome to unmute and ask a question. Um, however, please keep your microphones off otherwise. So here's a metaphor for you. So if if everything we needed to know about the human brain was a mile, then we might know a couple of inches of it. But we often, uh, in psychology, we often act and talk as if we had almost a, a complete knowledge. Right? So what does it mean when we say that a certain behavioral pattern is, is a disorder? Right? If, if you're saying that something is a disorder, that strongly implies that you know what order is you know what the correct or appropriate order of the human brain is. That strikes me as a little bit hubristic. Or when people talk about being like neurodiverse or, or they talk about neurotypical, what is neurotypical when we know so little about the human brain? So one of the, uh, let's, let's, go back about 200 years and, and people are trying to understand the human brain. So one of the, the first ways of trying to map it was, was called phrenology. And phrenology was a pseudoscience. But what people did was, well, there was an underlying theory that parts of your brain do different things, which is fundamentally right. Okay, like there is localization in the brain. We also tend to overstate it, but but they would think, okay, you know, this part of the brain is handles aggression, and, and maybe this part is is friendliness. And they thought that you know, if that area is bigger, then maybe you're more aggressive or more friendly. And they thought that these differences in uh, the brain size would correlate with um, differences in. In, it sort of bumps on your skull and then you could feel your skull right? you get your head examined and we could tell what what your personality and your abilities would be like based on feeling these bumps in the head um and i just see see a comment there that uh, much of what we know about the human brain is very based on the idea that white men are the baseline for what is normal which leaves out a good amount of the population 
that, yeah, that's true. And it's it's not just biological psychology that does that. So does IO psychology. So in industrial organizational psychology, they'll, they do job analyses and they say, you know what, they figure out what a job requires, but it's only based on like able-bodied people say doing that job. And they say, then these are the requirements that you need to have, but they're, they're never based on and we call these the bona fide occupational requirements. And you can exclude someone from that job based on them not meeting it. But it was never based on a philosophy of, of accommodation or inclusion. So, yeah, good point there. And also remember that 85% of psychology research is done on um, undergraduates who are a very, very unique kind of sample. Very white, very class privileged, very young. And... Um, when we need to do more invasive research, can't do that on humans. So it's done on rats. And there's a lot of ways that rats are like people and uh, you know, some ways that, that they're not. Um, so it's easy to knock pseudoscience and dismiss it completely, but sometimes it's on to something. So consider, uh, let's say the, the zodiac or astrology. It's pseudoscience, but the ancient Greeks were on to the idea that there's different kinds of people, that they're different trait profiles. And modern research on personality traits supports that, right? Some people are more agreeable. Some people are more um, disagreeable. Some people are more extroverted, but it, 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 does, it doesn't have anything to do with the constellation that you're born under. And so the phrenologists were ultimately wrong because, well, they were wrong about what part of the brain does what, but also, um, while it is true that if um, an increase in size with a certain brain region does tend to be increased with, with using it more, right? If humans are very visual animals, and so we have a, a large part of our brain is devoted to, to vision and visual processing, well, um, that doesn't necessarily correlate with a skull bump, right? Because your, the size of your skull can have, has to do with a lot of other things, right? So phrenology is ultimately, a, is a pseudoscience. It's ultimately wrong, but it's, but it's on to some really important ideas. And one is that there's localization of function. One way we've learned about how the brain works is through case studies of, of people who have had brain injury. So if we know that a certain part of somebody's brain or say their head um, has been damaged. Let's say you can see that on an x-ray. We might look at their behavior and notice that there's certain things they now can't do. So um, we learn that there's certain areas of the brain that are associated with speech comprehension and speech production from people who had strokes or other injuries um, that damaged a certain part of the brain. Many There are many case studies where somebody can't speak anymore, they're producing gibberish, and everyone seems to have damage around the, the same area. And so we say, this brain area seems to have something to do with speech production, or this brain area seems to have something with speech comprehension. Then there's experimental research. So if we really want to know if that, that part of the brain controls language, we would damage it and see if people, well, not people, uh, see if there's a loss of function. Humans are the only animals that have language, but let's say uh, it's spatial ability. Okay, so let's say we, we strongly suspect that there's a certain part of your brain that has to, that, that processes your spatial environment and helps you, you navigate. Because Maybe because there's case studies of humans that can't seem to find their way around anymore, and they all seem to have damage to that area. So then what scientists might do is take a rat and, or maybe 20 or 30 rats, and then ex damage that part of the rat's brain and then see how they do. Can they still run a maze? If they still can, well, maybe that part of the brain actually doesn't have anything to do with spatial perception. But if they're totally lost in the maze and can't figure it out up or down, then that provides support that that part of the brain um, is associated with spatial perception or spatial navigation. A lot of um, later on 
in this chapter, we'll, we'll talk about neurotransmitters, and we'll talk about drugs. A lot of the drug studies are, are done on rats, okay? And sometimes I wonder, you know, how does a rat study on, on a medication generalize to, to a human? Sometimes it's very well, sometimes not so much. Sometimes there is no rat study for the particular combination of medications that people are on. One of um, one of the first ways we had of measuring brain activity is uh, electroencephalograph, and that's when they put um, sort of gel on your head and electrodes. Oh, um, I see a question in the chat. Um, would that be considered ethical? The studies on animals. The answer to that question is that you have to convince uh, the university animal research ethics board that it's ethical. And and yes, they do brain lesion studies on animals. Um, could you convince a vegan that that's ethical? They would say no. So it depends on your value system. Ethics is, is a matter of moral philosophy, right? Which is about what is good and what is bad, which is about values. And there are different value systems and competing value systems. So back to EEG. Uh, I don't know if you ever had one of these done in, in a psych lab experiment, but um, they put this sort of net over. Well, first they put gel on your head and then they put these um, this cap that's got all these sensors on it and it, it measures brain waves. And, and that's great. We've, we've learned so much from that. The issue, though, is that it's picking up kind of average activity and it's not. It's not good at pinpointing certain areas of function. But this is how we know what your brain waves look like at different stages of arousal or of sleep. So here you can see what brain waves look like in someone who's who's awake. And, and then there's different stages of being awake, right? These gamma waves are produced when you're actively concentrating. And then these are our beta waves from you know, when you're active, but not like intensely focused. And then when you're watching sort of TV and, and you're resting, this is what you get these, these bigger waves. Those are called alpha waves. When you're getting drowsy, the waves slow down even more. And then the delta wave gets into a, to a certain stage of sleep and there isn't just one stage of sleep there there are a few stages and they're associated with different brain waves but what's interesting is that and there's also like cycles so we could say that oh um so in stage two you can see there i think these are called sleep spindles and and those occur every so often and so if you were sleeping in a sleep lab, the researchers would know what stage of sleep you're in from looking at that graph. They'd know if you're awake, they'd know if you're, you're in the earlier stages of sleep or in the deeper stages of sleep. And then there's REM sleep. And REM sleep is when you have these um, story-like dreams. And what's interesting about REM sleep is that the brain waves kind of look like when you're awake. Except, fortunately for you, your body's paralyzed. Well, you can still breathe, but um, REM sleep paralysis stops you from getting up and acting out your dreams, which could be dangerous. All right. We have more modern, more ad advanced ways of seeing the brain. And some of them get at structure and some of them are better for seeing function, for seeing activity. And... Uh, I don't know if any of you have had like a, a CT scan or an MRI, but they, they put you in a, a tube and a CT scan takes um, a lot of, takes many, many x-rays, okay, even like slices of the brain. And then we can put those together to construct a, a 3D image. I see a couple of questions in, in the chat. And someone's asking about sleep. So do people who sleepwalk or sleep talk not have REM sleep? Sleepwalking and sleep ha talking doesn't happen in REM sleep. It's something that happens in, I think it's stage one sleep. 
Um, another question. Uh, yes, and, and and then someone's mentioned that, yes, that's when night terrors happen. Those are really weird and kind of scary. So those early stages, different things happen to you in different stages of sleep. And when people believe they have alien abduction experiences, it's, it's always after they went to bed, right? It, aliens just don't seem to abduct people when they're when they're working in their garden or sitting on the toilet. It's always just after they went to sleep. That's when, you know, the 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 beam comes down to your bedroom and you start floating up into the spaceship. So there's a floaty thing. Um, another thing you might notice when you're just falling asleep is that you feel like you're falling backwards. Um, and someone said, yeah, they that they have those and, and sleepwalking and yes, yeah, so I've I've sleep I sl I've slept walked <laughs> before. And uh, people do different things when when they sleepwalk, and it is possible to have some pretty complex behavior. It's rare, but there are people who have like gone for a drive in their car while they're asleep. And uh, what I apparently do is is go to the kitchen, rummage around, and and eat food. Um, and there is another question: What is happening in the brain of someone who sleep talks or walks or has night terrors? Great question, and I hope that. Um, I hope we end up covering it. Um, I I would bet that it would be in chapter five on consciousness because sleep is, um, and the things that happen to your mind when you're asleep are, are part of consciousness. So I, I hope we get to that later in, in the course. And I don't know um, anything about, um, like sleep is different in children, right? Sleep changes as we get older, get less and less REM sleep, a lower and lower sleep quality, actually, uh, waking up more in the night. Um, but so, but I don't know the answer to the question of of why do kids uh, sleep walk often and probably have something to do with, with brain development. Okay, so we can take pictures of your brain with, with x-rays and then put those, you get 2D images, but we can put them together into to a 3D image. And then another way to do it is with, um, by measuring magnetic fields. And that can, that's another way that we can visualize brain structure. Now let's say we, we have a question about how your brain works. Okay, so what area of the brain is active when you, when you do a certain thing? For that, we need to use different tools. So one of them is called functional MRI. It's based on, on magnetic fields. Position, positron, <laughs> positron emission tomography measures the consumption of a glucose-like molecule. And that's because when a certain part of your brain is, is active, it consumes more fuel. So uh, the researchers uh, have you, I assume they that have you drink something uh, where there is a little bit of, uh, a little bit radioactive, not too radioactive. Um, it's, it's like a glucose-like molecule. And then they can track that and they can see how quickly it's, it's getting consumed. And the idea, more activity, higher rate of con consumption. Um, these pictures you see of brains can sometimes be misinterpreted. So first of all, those th this lighting up, this idea that when you do something, a certain area of your brain lights up, that's obviously metaphorical. The researchers add those colors to the pictures to make a point. And the colors they pick are could be arbitrary. Um, sometimes they they use a spectrum to say red is low activity and, and blue is high activity, or maybe do do the opposite. Okay, so understand that that's, there's some artistic license. And uh, th there was a, a funny story in, in, in your textbook about how some researchers put a dead fish in like an MRI and, and then they asked it questions and they tracked its brain activity while it was, well, <laughs> presumably answering the questions. And, and they ended up with, with a, an image like this that showed what area of the fish's brain was active when it was answering questions. And, you know, that was because the machine, well, it, it picks up edge fluctuations in, in, in energy. And some of that is noise, right? Some of that is, is chance. And so 
when you see one of these these images, you know, think about how well the study was done and did they apply any kind of statistical controls on the data to to control for those those chance effects. And in, in that case, it, it shows the importance of replication, because I imagine if that 100 different researchers use the exact same methods and the same data analysis methods with um, with 100 other dead fish, uh, it would show you know, it would show the same part of the dead fish's brain lighting up, unless that said something about the way the um, the machine works and and detects energy. Maybe there's a certain you know part of it that's that, that's more sensitive to to fluctuations somewhere. Um, uh, there's a question saying there's there's brain activity after death. No, there isn't, and that's why it shows that this was an issue with the analysis or an issue with the measurement. So when you measure something, you're not just measuring signal, you're also measuring noise. Like this microphone is recording my voice, which is a signal. And there's a lot of other background random stuff that it's also picking up. And it could even, some noise could come through to you that actually doesn't come to my, that isn't coming from my voice. Maybe you hear a crackle that has something to do with this microphone. But it's not me, my voice crackling. And then yes, but yes, ghost ghost hunters would would have have a field day. And I think that a lot of that ghost hunting thing is about taking, you know, uh, tools that can pick up a whole bunch of different stuff and and walking around with it, and being like, oh, it picked up a signal. It picked up. It's gonna do some of that anyway, right? There's there's no. I'm not aware of of any measures that um, that purely pick up signal with, with zero noise. Then um, there's another method called magnetoencephalography, and it measures tiny magnetic fields generated by the brain. And the advantage of this one is that um, you can measure on like a changes in brain activity on a millisecond by millisecond basis versus let's say a second by second basis. And I see a question, Bob's Burger, uh, a comment from Shirley, Bob's Burgers has a great ghost episode that makes fun of the tech they use. I would love to see that if if you can um, find that and, and send it to me. Um, I'd love to watch that. I've never heard of the show. Sounds like it isn't about burgers. Something interesting that we learned from these uh, from these studies of brain activation and, and localization. So let's say researchers are asking the the subjects who are in these tubes to think of a certain thing, like you know, think of a smell, and then then seeing what part of the brain becomes active. And we're thinking, okay, so this part of the brain is localized to um, for, for uh, processing information about scent. Or, or maybe actually make them smell something while they're in the tube, see what happens, okay? Um, make them, I don't know, touch a certain part of the body and see what, what gets activated. You know, ask them to think of this, ask them to think of that. Okay, and you gotta, you know, ask them to uh, think of something they've seen. And, and we're looking at what parts of the brain are, are more active, like obviously the whole brain is active. But we're seeing what parts are more active to, to get an understanding of this localization of function. Well, what happens when you ask people not to think of anything or you just instruct them to rest? Well, there's all kinds of activation. Your mind wanders when it is resting. So let's say a human, a normal human attention span is about, um, I don't know, say 15 minutes. And let's say you focus intentionally on this lecture and say you're taking notes. And what's going to happen after about 15 minutes? Almost like let's say you're in, in the gym and, and you're lifting weights and you do that for 15 minutes. You're going you're gonna to need to rest. But at the gym, you probably, maybe you put your arms down and you don't move your arms. Or maybe you like stretch them, okay? 
probably what you do, isn't it? And so what your mind does when it rests is, is wander around. Okay? So that's your mind resting. And some people think when they that when they sort of rest or meditate that they shouldn't be having any thoughts. And they might try to stop having the thoughts. And that's not going to work for you. And so what you might try to do instead is to just think of these thoughts that, that go by as like traffic flowing down the road. Or, or clouds passing in the sky. And you could restfully just understand that's your mind resting. Let the clouds pass by. Let the, uh, the traffic flow by instead of, of trying to control it. And then when you're rested up and ready, you can, you can get back to listening to your lecture, writing your paper, or what else required that really intense kind of concentration that you're only capable of, of sustaining for, for so long. Um, a comment there, are they Buddhist? Well, different traditions that involve meditation have certain sort of different techniques for what you can do with your mind. And, and one thing that some people will do to say, I think, I think it would be to, to can manage these thoughts or distractions is to go like, make a sound, like, Aum, and then that kind of fills your mind. Or you could, um, you know, like, look into a fire. Now, what about getting more invasive? Some of the things that do during brain surgery would like um, would touch a certain area and uh, then see what the patient did. You, you actually, you can't feel your brain, right? There's no um, sensory receptors in your brain. So assuming that you've been anesthetized, anesthetized enough to let them, um, you know, get into your brain uh, because it, I guess they have to like drill bone to get in there. Um, then you can have a patient who's actually conscious during a procedure and, you know, touch something over here and, and see what happens. Right. Then there was that whole smelling burnt toast thing. Um, this can be done with, with electrodes. It's a potential treatment for some disorders. And, um, I wonder, like, do they leave the electrodes in there or do they take them out? Um, and then there's transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they can apply um, magnetic fields to the surface of the skull. And that could either enhance brain function in a certain region or, or interrupt it. Something uh, they did back in the day was uh, with, they did it with electricity. Like, have you seen, like, one flew over the cuckoo's nest? Like, some... One treatment for, for I can't remember what it's called when they apply like an, an electric current. And actually can, there's evidence that it can help people with, um, with severe depression. And it's not a first line treatment though. So your, yes, yes, Jacob, um, uh, a student there commented there was ECTS, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, there's a question there. Does all this affect the brain? Yes. So deep brain stimulation affects the, the brain, function of the brain. So does electroconvulsive therapy. So does, um, what, what, was, what was it called? I forget here. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. These are, these are efforts to, usually to intervene to fix something, but we can also learn from it. Um, if we were just um, trying to find out what parts of the brain do without any desire to to treat a person then we would do that on animals not on humans so like the rest of your body your your brain is is made of cells but they're a very there's a very special kind of cell and neurons are brain cells that are specialized for communication and they communicate in an electrochemical language and they say that there are about 86 billion neurons in your nervous system or in your brain. How would they know that? How would they get, how did they figure that one out?
Well, 86 billion is a high number to count up to. It would involve some amount of individual counting. You could take a human brain. Um, yeah, so so both of you were right. It involves some individual counting and, and some guesstimation. So this is apparently this is what they do. Um, you, you take a human brain, a preserved one. Yes, uh, Charmaine is is on it. Count in a small area and then multiply it with with the whole. Yes. So they um, take a, a very small section of, of human brain. And you could say, all right, this is one gram of brain. And the whole thing is, I don't know, how, how much does brain weigh? It's been like, like, I can't remember. <laughs> it's more than one gram. Uh, whatever the, the weight of uh, the, the human brain was in, in grams. So you could say, let's say, take one thousandth of that. And then there's some way to dissolve it into like brain soup. And then you can count the number of, of neurons in, you know, a drop of brain soup. That's how to do it. So, yes, uh, the 86 billion is uh, is a guesstimate that is an educated guesstimate based on brain soup. Uh, the neurons are very special cells and, and the membrane of neurons has special properties that allow it to communicate electrically. So the basic structure of a neuron, that looks like a scary alien creature. Uh, there's a, a cell body that's called the soma, and that's where you know, you'd find the nucleus of the cell, where it manufactures proteins, where it, so, you know, you'd find the mitochondria, that kind of stuff. It's where new cell components are built. And you, you kill the soma, you, you kill, you destroy the neuron. Then Neurons have this this long tail, and that that is part of it, which is how it communicates with other neurons and and reaches across to places. The longest axons in your body are about a meter long, and they'd be the ones that run from your spine down your leg. And then there are these these dendrites, okay, and the dendrites receive information. They have they have receptors that, that pick up neurotransmitters. So this is the, the signals are electrochemical si signals. There's an electrical signal that moves down the axon, down the tail. But when it reaches the end of the tail, um, before it gets to to the dendrites, it, it releases something called neurotransmitters. And then the neurotransmitters. I like to think of them as little boats that <laughs> sail across to receptors on the receiving neuron, and, and then that will trigger another electrical impulse. Okay, so it's electrochemical. The textbook gives an example or a metaphor for, for neurotransmitters as that they're like those cold, you know, those pills that gel capsules that dissolve as um as, as they go through through your body to be later released so um they're they're making a metaphor they're saying that the synaptic vesicles that hold the neurotransmitters are are like those um gel capsule pills um and and there's a comment there i think I have short dendrites because fast reflexes i don't know i don't know what the the correlation uh what length of dendrite would mean um there are different kinds of neurotransmitters that are associated with different responses, and we'll talk about those later on. And the neurotransmitters have to travel across a, a space, right? That's called the synaptic cleft. Okay, and, and the neurotransmitters travel across that. And things can happen to them there, right? They can get absorbed and taken out of the picture. And so one thing that um, certain drugs do that are called reuptake inhibitors is that they they keep 
that neurotransmitter around the synapse for longer. So one common treatment for depression is a, is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor that functions to, to keep the serotonin around for longer. And that means it has more time to engage with the receptors on the receiving neuron. Neurons are not the only cells in your nervous system. There's actually many different kinds of cells. And there's some that are called glial cells. And at first, researchers uh, didn't really know what, what these were. And they figured that uh, they're just some kind of scaffolding to hold up the, the neuron. Maybe they're in, involved in, in feeding and, and protecting the neuron. There's a lot of them, right? There's about one glial cell for, for every neuron. And they do play a valuable support role, but you know we know and so little about the human brain. So we know so little about what glial cells do, but they do seem to have some role in psychological functioning. But I can't tell you more than that. There are many different types of glial cells, and a couple of them that are particularly important. I suppose they're all important, but let's say that some of them that we know a lot more about. Um, are the um, astroglia and the oligodendroglia. The astrocytes are star-shaped. Aster is the Latin word for star. And they're the most abundant kind of glial cell. And um, they increase the reliability of of neuronal transmission. We find a lot of them in, in the blood-brain barrier. The, the blood vessels in your nervous system have a special characteristic. There's, um, and it's something that protects your, your brain because um, your brain is very sensitive. You want to protect it from, from toxins and, and things that shouldn't be there. You want to protect it from infection, right? A brain infection. Wow, that'll really mess you up. And, and what if there's, a, you know, a, something in your blood that's, that's not very healthy? Or what if there is some, some pathogen there? Well, well, the blood-brain barrier protects you from that. And the blood-brain barrier is easily permeable to, to gases and, and to water. So oxygen can cross it easily and, and water can across it easily. But and um, important things like glucose can be effortfully actively transported across it. But there's lots of other things that can't get past it. So it's um, it defends you. Um, and then there's the oligodendrocytes. And they are part of the, the myelin sheath around your axons. So think of the axon as like a, a wire, like like this one that I have here. Well, is there something protecting this wire? Like, is it, it it's not, you don't just see the metal wire because, you know, I have another wire here and gee, I don't know what would happen if, if they touched, that might not be too good. So what this wire has is a rubber protective coating and that protects the electrical signal, right? Stops it from, um, uh, you know, being activated by things it shouldn't be activated by, um, keeps it nice and efficient. And your nervous system has something like that too. It's called the myelin sheath. And there's a disorder that, um, sort of an immune disorder, I believe, that, that attacks the, the myelin sheath. It's called, uh, and that's multiple sclerosis. So what happens to people who have their myelin damaged by multiple sclerosis is that their movement becomes difficult to move, right? Their, their movements may be uncoordinated, may not be able to initiate a movement. So myelin is important. There's a question there. Do we have myelin sheaths in other places of our bodies or in the brain? The myelin sheath protects the, um, the axon. And the, I believe the electrical signal actually sort of jumps uh, along these, these nodes uh, but it's very important. So those are two really important functions of glial cells in your nervous system. And there, there's more even than that, right? Because there's so much that we don't know. So we are at about 1020. I've got a minute left. And I think this is a good place to stop. And this is where I'll pick up next time. And we can, we'll can we talk about how the neuron fires. Are there um, any questions?
the question in the chat. Is there any practice questions we could go over to review for the midterm? Uh, so your midterm is next week on Wednesday. And um, this course was previously taught by another instructor who I'm filling in for. And I am to the greatest extent using, you know, following the structure that she set up. And um, she has exams that are written up. And so what I'm going to do is go look at those midterms. I haven't had the chance to do that yet, actually. Um, and I know that I'm going to be removing the short answer questions for that. And that's because I, I do not have the capacity uh, to grade 222 or how many. Yeah, the enrollment of this class is, is 220. I, I can't. I don't have the capacity to do that because this course is a new prep for me and I'm reading the textbook. So I can tell you there won't be short answer questions. Um, I'm going to take those off. And she does have a practice midterm. And so I will clean that up and, and send it to you. No, um, there is a sorry, so there's a few more questions there. So another one is uh, to clarify, do you say that someone with a multiple sclerosis has a myelin shortage? It's a, a disease that where the myelin is sort of, I believe it's attacked by the immune system. And no, I don't have a teaching assistant. So um, often teaching assistants will grade um, short answer questions. However, um, this is a class that I took on kind of at the last minute. And um, it's supposed to be a 10 hour week job. And so um, since I'm teaching it for the first time, that time is, is spent doing things like reading the textbook and putting slide decks together. I don't have the capacity to also um, train a TA. And actually, the, the previous instructor warned me. She said that she didn't um, she didn't use TAs for grading. She thought that there was um, it caused more issues. So you have to train them really well, and then things can come up. And she thought that that was it was actually not not worth it. So I thought, okay, now I'm I'm really not going to use short answer questions. So I ran that by the undergraduate program coordinator, who said that was that was fine. It also means that your exam would be auto graded and you'd see the result immediately. It's a question to say that it would be open book. I couldn't find it in the syllabus and I can't remember if this was cl this class. Yes, it will be open book. Sorry, so does this mean that it's all multiple choice questions? Um, she had, um, I haven't looked at the actual exam yet, but I did read her instructions and I saw that there were like matching questions. So there's various different forms of questions that can be auto graded. So there can be multiple choice questions. Sometimes there's like fill in the blanks or select something. Um, so there will probably be more than one type of question. And I see some one had their, their hand raised. And you're just welcome to use your mic or oh i'm still recording let me turn off the recording i'll, I'll cut this this out okay of, of the recording but it's recording transcribe stop recording sorry about that so now it's official